My wife heard a skinwalker in our house last night. Let me start off by saying that my wife doesn't believe in paranormal entities or anything of that nature. We have three cats, and one of them likes to be a rebel, jumping onto counters and meowing at the top of his lungs, just looking for attention. He does this throughout the night, and it's a regular occurrence. Last night, after a few beers and video games, I decided it was time to head to bed with my wife. When I woke up this morning, my wife was basically attached to me with wide eyes and a nervous look on her face. I asked her what was wrong, and she proceeded to tell me what happened last night. She said that around 2.50 in the morning, she was woken up to a noise that sounded like one of our cats downstairs meowing unusually loud. After giving herself a few seconds to perk up and fully pay attention, she said that the meows sounded more like a person trying to mimic a cat, and it kept saying hello. After meowing for two to three minutes, a loud bang came at our door, and then a notification went off for a motion sensor at our front door. When she told me this, I checked my phone, and sure enough, there was a notification for motion detected at 2.52 a.m. I asked her why she didn't wake me up so I could grab my gun. She said she was frozen with fear and didn't want it to hear her make a noise. We're out running errands while I'm typing this, but something made me uncomfortable about her story. Last night, I set the home security alarm around 9 p.m., and we didn't turn it off till we walked the dog this morning. To make things worse, we had slept with, with all of the animals in the room, and the door was closed. So whatever was in our house or outside the front door was not one of our animals. Obviously, the first thing that came to my mind was a skinwalker, but maybe I'm just being paranoid. I checked all the rooms in the house after I got up. I'm not sure what I could have done anyways. It's very odd that my wife was scared so badly by something she doesn't necessarily believe in. We bought this house brand new, so no one has lived here before. When I'm home alone, I do feel like I'm being watched, or someone's always walking directly behind me. My wife also said that the house has given her chills since we moved in. Something is just off about it. We just got home and I went to hang up one of my shirts in the master bedroom closet when I noticed that the board that covers the attic access has been shifted a little. When I asked my wife about it, she said she's never been up there and the builders would have placed it back in its original place before we made the purchase. I'm genuinely getting anxious just thinking about what could be going on. Has anyone had an experience like this? Or similar, at least. We're going to my mother-in-law's to get some sage. My wife said burning it should keep whatever's around our house away. My grandfather told me a story once, as we sat around a campfire in his backyard in the cool night of the Arizona desert. The horizon was clear, and each star twinkled in a purple sky, with a full fat moon hanging low over the mountains. His voice was raspy and gravelly, the result of a lifetime of smoking cigars and drinking whiskey. The fire danced and shined across his wide, dark eyes as he settled into his seat, ready to tell his story. Way back when I was a boy about your age, he began, I lived outside an Apache reservation with your great-grandfather. He had returned from the war and set about raising horses and cattle on 100-acre ranch settled between a brambly mountainside with dirt good for growing thornbrush and not much else. One night my mother was sick and Pa and I took a trip into town about 50 miles away straight through a dry desert over a washed-out creek and some old abandoned farmsteads. The fire sparked and a log cracked, jolting me out of the story. What next? I asked. Settle down, boy. You'll hear soon enough. Pa and I were driving in an old Ford pickup truck. I remember it was dark out, inky and thick, with only the lights of our old truck lighting up the road. I remember, too, when the engine began to sputter and the truck slowed to a jerky stop. God damn it, Pa said, guiding the Ford to the side of the road as it coasted to a halt. Stay here, son, as he stepped out into the darkness, shutting the door with a heavy thud. My window was down, and the cool desert air was breezy and felt good on my hot face and neck. Pa was getting water from the back to cool the engine, and that's when I smelled it. Rotten eggs. Strange, I thought, to smell sulfur in the desert. My nose also picked up carrion, 
like one of them dead bloated cattle that would drop from the heat, and lay there until the crows pecked enough holes in their hide to cause the whole thing to explode. It stunk, and I gagged. My skin started to tingle too. The back of my neck felt itchy, and my face started to get hot. The wind stopped blowing and hung still and heavy, with the stink filling the cab. Pa, I called. Pa, P.A. <sighs> no answer. My heart started beating and I felt such a fear in me, in my bones, in my chest. Boy, I tell you, I never felt fear like this, not until Vietnam, not until I saw men dying around me. I locked the door and reached over for my past door and saw a shadow bound across the road, through both dim beams of light across the partly open domed hood. Grandfather paused. He spit a fat wad of tobacco spit off to his side, and he looked pensively into the darkness. I realized I was holding my breath and gasped for air. The night was cool, but I was sweating and clammy. Well, what happened? What about your father? What did you see? He sighed. A creature. He shook his head. You have to understand. There were legends. Old legends. Older than the rock cairns out in the valley. Older still than Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, than the old Injun chiefs and their shamans. The Apache and Hop and Cherokee, and all them old tribes and first peoples. They told tales, old stories, about dark Injun magic. A deal made with the old spirits, of blood sacrifice, to gain power, old power, enough to fight each other, and the Spaniards, and later the white men that came for their land and women. They called them, he paused, grandfather took a deep breath, and bodied forward into his tail, across the fire and the sky, the desert, the creek, the moon, the sun, and old mountains, he bodied forward. They called them skinwalkers, shape changers, old warriors resurrected as skinless men, all sinew and muscle, walking on deer legs with the torso of a man and the head of a coyote. But messed up, boy, long and malformed snouts, teeth like a bowie knife, long arms and standing seven foot, even hunched over. They'd gut the old cowboys and white riders, they'd run through bullets and sabers, part the Spanish armor like it was a potato sack. Wily, too, they could change their voice to match a person you knew, or might know. Boy, that's what I saw. Big and fast, only for a second it ran across the road, gray and mottled muscle flexing under its legs, hooves clomping on the road, stringy muscled hunched shoulders. And it turned, looked right into the cab, looked right into my eyes, and I swear, boy, I swear it grinned at me. I sank into my seat, in shock, in fear, shaking. I knew death was near. The air was electric. I smelled ozone and brimstone. The air felt like right before the lightning comes and blows a tree to smithereens. Charged and full with power, I yelled for my paw, but no words came out, just a dry squeak. I was shaking as Grandfather told his story. He was still here, so I know he lived, but the supernatural always fascinated me, and even now I felt the force of his words. The real power of skinwalkers was trickery. Sure, they could change their voices, but also their skin. That's why the gods took their hide, so they could take others. Not for long, the legends say. Maybe an hour before the soul of the skin they wore would come looking for their mortal shell before going to whatever hell awaited them. Though I think that getting skinned alive was hell enough. A minute passed in what felt like a lifetime, one second in one thousand years. My father's door opened and I jerked my head to the left, putting my fists up to fend off attack. Son, it's me, my father said before climbing into the cab. He grasped the steering wheel and pulled himself in awkwardly, jerking himself into the seat. I cringed into the corner. I looked at him. I looked hard. Boy, your great-grandfather was a good man, treated me and my ma right. He fought the Nazis and saw the worst of man in Poland when he freed all them camps. And now I was taking his measure. Is this my father? Do I make a run or do I die? Is it him or not? Let's go get that medicine for your ma, as he pulled the truck into gear and pulled it out onto the road, and our trip resumed. I guess it was him after all. But how did you know? Was it because he said something about your mom? 
No boy I knew because out the window, out the corner of my eye, I seen that beast running 50 miles an hour right next to the car, looking at me with them yellow eyes and grinning mouth. I looked and saw it, hunched and angry, running next to us, boy. My pa kept his eyes on the road, locked straight forward. Son, he said, don't look at it, don't look at it. That's how I knew, boy. The names were changed for privacy. The story is the same as best as I could remember it. It was late October, a night when the wind howled through the trees like a restless spirit, and the moon hung low, casting long, eerie shadows over the desolate landscape. I was visiting my grandparents' ranch in New Mexico, nestled deep in the desert, miles from the nearest town. The ranch had always been a place of comfort for me, a place where I could escape the noise of the city and bask in the quiet solitude of the open land. But that night something felt different, like the land itself was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. Hey, you ever hear those stories about skinwalkers? My cousin Ethan asked, his voice breaking the silence as we sat by the fire pit outside. The flames flickered, casting a warm glow on our faces, but it did little to dispel the growing unease in my gut. Skinwalkers, I repeated, glancing over at him. His expression was serious, almost too serious for a kid who usually joked about everything. Yeah, he said, lowering his voice as if the very mention of the word could summon something from the shadows. They're these evil witches or spirits, I'm not really sure. They can shapeshift into animals, wolves, coyotes, whatever. But they're not just animals, you know. There's something else, something wrong. I chuckled nervously, trying to shake off the creepy feeling creeping up my spine. Come on, Ethan. That's just some Navajo legend, right? Something to scare kids? Ethan didn't laugh. Instead, he leaned closer to the fire, his eyes narrowing as he stared into the flames. I wouldn't be so sure. My dad said he saw one once, out near the old cattle pens. Said it was a coyote, but when he looked into its eyes, he knew it wasn't just an animal. It was like it was looking into him, reading his thoughts or something. A shiver ran down my spine despite the warmth of the fire. What happened? He backed away slowly, got the hell out of there, but he swears it followed him home that night, heard scratching at the windows like it was trying to get inside. Ethan paused, his voice dropping to a whisper. Said he heard it whispering his name. Okay, enough. I forced a laugh, though my voice wavered. You're just trying to freak me out. Ethan shrugged, a grim smile on his face. Believe what you want, just don't go wandering off alone tonight. We sat in silence for a while, the wind howling louder as the night grew darker. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, that something was out there, just beyond the reach of the firelight. I'm heading in, I said finally, standing up and brushing the dirt off my jeans. It's getting cold. Ethan nodded, his eyes scanning the darkness beyond the fire. Yeah, good idea. I'll be right behind you. As I turned to head back to the house, I heard it. A low, guttural growl, so deep it seemed to vibrate through the ground beneath my feet. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. Did you hear that? I whispered, my voice barely audible. Ethan was already on his feet, his eyes wide with fear. Don't move, he hissed. Whatever you do, don't run. The growl came again, closer this time. Slowly, I turned my head, my breath catching in my throat as I saw it. A pair of glowing eyes in the darkness fixed on us with an intensity that sent a wave of pure terror through my body. The creature was massive, hunched over on all fours like a wolf. But there was something horribly wrong with it. Its limbs were too long, too distorted, and its fur was matted and filthy, almost like it was rotting away. And those eyes, they weren't the eyes of an animal. They were filled with malice, with a sick, twisted intelligence that made my blood run cold. Get to the house now. Ethan whispered, his voice shaking. We backed away slowly, never taking our eyes off the creature. It didn't move, just watched us, its growl rumbling through the night air like a warning. My heart raced as we reached the edge of the firelight, the safety of the house still too far away. And then, with a sudden terrifying speed, the creature lunged forward. Run! Ethan shouted, grabbing my arm and yanking me toward the house. We sprinted across the yard, the sound of the creature's heavy breathing right behind us. 
I could hear its claws scraping against the ground, its growl turning into a savage snarl as it closed the distance between us. My legs burned, my lungs screamed for air, but I didn't dare slow down. The porch light was in sight, the old wooden steps just a few feet away. Ethan reached them first, throwing himself up the stairs and bursting through the door. I was right behind him, my hand outstretched, but just as I reached the steps, something sharp sliced across my ankle, sending me crashing to the ground. Get up! Ethan screamed from the doorway, but the pain was too intense. I looked back and my heart stopped. The creature was right there, towering over me, its breath hot and rancid on my face. Please, I whispered, barely able to speak. The creature tilted its head, almost as if it were curious, its glowing eyes narrowing. And then, to my horror, it began to change. Its fur receded, its limbs twisted and cracked, contorting into a grotesque parody of a human form. Within moments it was standing upright, a tall, gaunt figure with skin so pale it seemed to glow in the dark. Its face was a nightmare, a twisted, elongated snout with sharp, jagged teeth, and those eyes, those terrible, glowing eyes that now looked disturbingly human. It leaned down, its face inches from mine, and I heard it speak in a low, rasping voice that made my skin crawl. You shouldn't have come here, it whispered, its breath like ice against my skin. With a surge of adrenaline, I kicked out with my good leg, catching it off guard. It stumbled back and I scrambled to my feet, half crawling, half running up the steps. Ethan grabbed me, pulling me inside just as the creature lunged again, its claws raking across the door as we slammed it shut. We collapsed on the floor, gasping for breath, our hearts pounding in our chests. The creature howled in rage, the sound echoing through the house, rattling the windows. We could hear it circling outside, its heavy footsteps crunching on the gravel as it stalked around the house, looking for a way in. We need to call someone, I gasped, my voice trembling. The police, anyone. Who's gonna believe us, Ethan said, his voice just as shaky. They'll think we're crazy. We huddled together in the middle of the room, every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of the wind outside sending a fresh wave of fear through us. The creature's howls grew fainter, then stopped altogether. But we knew it was still out there, waiting, watching. We can't stay here, I whispered, my voice barely audible. It'll get in eventually. Ethan nodded, but neither of us moved. We were too terrified, too paralyzed by the thought of what was waiting for us outside. Hours passed, though it felt like days, and the night dragged on in suffocating silence. Finally, as the first light of dawn began to creep through the windows, we heard it, the soft padding of footsteps moving away from the house, disappearing into the distance. We waited until the sun was fully up, until the warmth of daylight filled the room, before we dared to move. Slowly, cautiously, we opened the door and stepped outside. The yard was empty, the only sign of what had happened, the deep gouges in the ground where the creature had stood. But I knew it wasn't over. The memory of those glowing eyes, that voice whispering in the dark, would haunt me forever. We never spoke of that night again, not to each other, not to anyone. But from that day on, I never went near the ranch at night, and I always kept a wary eye on the shadows, knowing that somewhere out there the Skinwalker was waiting, and it knew my name. Thanks for watching. Much love, and don't forget to subscribe to show some support.